Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm with Helen today. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Helen has a blog and business called The Guilty Mothers Club and she's also recently founded The Mothership with Anna Hardy, who's her work bestie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Work wife. Yeah, she's her work wife. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, she's really passionate about women, like feminism, working mums, so we're going to have a good chat today. Yeah, yeah. She's also really organised and loves bullet journeys. So <laughs> we just we're like the same person. Yeah. So tell us a bit more about yourself. How did you get to doing what you do today? Um, so I started about two years ago um, when I launched Girls Mothers Club. Um, before that, my background's in leadership and development, so I spent my career in HR roles, but largely managing talents and I did a lot about women in leadership and designing and delivering training programs basically was kind of part of my role and um, then I got pregnant and went off to have our eldest Mabel who was seven yesterday, I've got a seven year old, I don't know how that happened um, <laughs> and when I got, went back after mat leave I was probably completely naive to how hard it was going to be and I went back and um, was still really ambitious and but I went back part-time and I remember having conversations around, yeah, you're not going to be able to get that promotion anymore because you don't get them part-time and being really frustrated and also just generally finding it much harder than I thought. I think your confidence gets knocked when you go back after maternity leave, or it can do, and it did for me. Um, so uh, I just lost a bit of my direction, I suppose. I lost confidence. I didn't really know what I was, what I was doing anymore. Um, and then I started chatting to other mum friends and realising that this was a really common thing, that yeah. it's kind of key transition in your life where I think you start to realise, like, do I even want to do this job anymore? And, and then when you tie that into the fact that so many women face discrimination at maternity leave and um, the fact that there's so few flexible jobs and you've got this issue of childcare, I think all of that combined means that it's quite a common thing that you face this. Kind of, oh, what do I do? Yeah. Um, and I definitely faced that. And so I've had two, I had two more babies. So I've got, um, I've got three now. My youngest is three. Um, and then I faced some maternity discrimination after going back after my third one, and just thought, right, this is it. So I've had enough. I can't keep going back to this corporate role. Um, because I was working for a big corporation. And then I decided that I was going to go it alone. And in the meantime, I'd been trying some stuff out. I'd been doing stuff in kind of my spare time. I'd been working in the evenings. Every nap time, I was trying to, like, busy squirreling away, like I'm sure yeah. loads of people are. Because I had this idea in my head that I thought, um, wouldn't it be ace if I could bring together other mums that are feeling like this and do something about it and help other people to feel more empowered to, um, you know, take control of their career and... Um, and also have a family that that's okay and kind of work through that balance thing. So, yeah, so um, Guilty Mother's Club was born and it started off just as events. So I started off just running a couple of events in Manchester, which is where I live. And um, uh, then it, um, last year was kind of a big year. The first year was kind of trying stuff out, running workshops. I was running workshops from like my front room over there. And, yeah, uh, <laughs> it is, but it wasn't very professional. <laughs> it was cosy. It was cosy. Yeah, they were unpaid workshops. It's like just come round. We'll drink tea. We'll hang out. And, um, it was quite cool, but it wasn't a business. It was. It was. But I think that's how lots of people try to start out, isn't it? You start just trying things, and you see, like, could I charge for this? And what could that? And getting feedback and surveying and. I think I probably took a bit longer over that section. I kind of procrastinated quite a bit. And then eventually, over last year, I kind of really started building it up because my husband took a year off to be at home with the kids. So I now work on it full time. Um, and we moved all our courses online and that's been like a massive change. Yeah. Because now we can reach so many more women. So it's been ace. And last year was a really big year. So we... Um, is this too much at the start? No, go for it. <laughs> so we moved... Uh, <laughs> Last year we moved Game Changers, which is kind of our key, one of our key programmes that we run, which is for women that want to make a career change or some other kind of big change in their life. Um, and we moved that online last year, in January last year, and that was ace. So we've had uh, 90, uh, 90 or so women go through that so far. That's amazing. Oh, it was, it was just ace. And then, yeah, we launched Mothership at the start of this year, yeah. which is like the next step of Girls and Mothers Club. Yeah. Um, just trying to build the kind of community side, I suppose. And Yeah. So that's like an online hub for women to go for support in any area. Yeah, it's like a, I almost describe it a bit like a like a, a development academy for yeah. for mums where you can go and so we do things on time management and um, 
uh, as we've done like goal setting and you can get all these different developments but also being surrounded by this community of other mums that are in really similar positions so we have this online virtual workspace and and then we also do kind of fun stuff as well because the idea is it's not just about work it's about also self-care and having yeah. time for other things and um, inspiring each other so we have live live goal setting calls where we all hold each other accountable um as well as you know uh, inspiring interviews and recipes and oh yeah it's just this kind of amazing hub for mums that I can't get enough of yeah <laughs> I'm always on it when um, when I first met Helen she came to a talk for We Bog North Social in December and quite a few of the girls including me were like I'm not a mum but I really want mm, to be a part mm. of it <laughs> it sounds so fun oh I had this whole conversation <laughs> yeah because I'm really <laughs> conscious of that yeah. and I remember but, saying that to you yeah. it's like if I could do this for every woman, I would, but we are most... It's all about the niche, It's all it? about... Well, someone told me that, that you have to find your niche, and exactly. I'm horrendous for that, because I get so carried away that we could have a conversation by the end of today, I'd be like, never mind, mums, let's take over the yeah. world, we'll do all women, and then yeah. we'll do dads, and then we'll do... Yeah. And I know that that's, like, I know I'm bad at that, so I'm trying to stick to my niche, yeah. and for me, it was particularly around this period that I know... For mums can be a really difficult one, so that was where I was focusing my need. That's kind of my was my passion, so I, I'm sticking to my niche. Yeah, find your niche. Good. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's a great place to be. Like when you discover what you're passionate about, what you love talking about, what you feel like you can really make a difference with. Yeah. But also what makes sense from a business yeah. perspective in terms of the audience is there, like the need is there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, with that being said, tell me about um, maternity discrimination and all that kind of stuff because I don't have kids. I've never experienced <laughs> that. I imagine a lot of women listening to this might just be having kids. They might be on maternity leave for the first child, oh, yeah. or they might be considering kids in the next few years. What did you go through, if you don't mind talking about it? And also, what advice would you give for women going through it right now? Whether it's women who want to go back to their position or women who are struggling with it and thinking of pivoting and changing direction yeah. and doing what you did and doing something that's for themselves Good and can fit more with their family. Um, well, it's a big problem. Yeah, yeah. Discrimin- discrimination is a big problem. And um, so the stats show that around 70,000 women um, face some sort of discriminatory behaviour, whether that's like a comment or a not being kind of put forward for a promotion or a, they basically felt some sort of discrimination in the workplace. Um, another 52,000 are sacked or lose their jobs because of being pregnant. Which is illegal. Yeah, it's completely legal. Yeah, it's completely legal. So there's um, there's amazing organisations like Pregnant and Screwed. So my first thing would be if yeah. you feel like you want some advice on whether it is legal and whether what you're going through is fair and right and you're just not sure or you just want some support then Pregnant Then Screwed um, are amazing that's run by my friend Jolie and she's she campaigns for um, an end to maternity discrimination and lots of other things uh, and she there's a free helpline that you can ring to get some advice and there's also a flexible working helpline that you can ring so they are amazing resources so my first thing would be um, don't feel like you're on your own because yeah. And this this all kind of wasn't available when it happened to me. Like I know that I feel like it's ancient, but like Mabel seven, so I didn't have a smartphone when I had Mabel. Like this whole world wasn't yeah. there, so it felt much lonelier. I think than it yeah. probably would now. And yeah. um, and I honestly thought I was the only person, and I thought everyone else was kind of obviously completely nailing the whole managing a family and um, having a career, and it was just me that was finding it so hard. So I think my first thing would be that that's not true. I think. Yeah. So many women find both the the transition of going back to work after maternity and also like the juggle. The juggle is massive and I think um and can be tricky. So I think don't feel alone if you're feeling any of that. Um will probably be my first thing. But I'm painting a bit of a bleak picture and it doesn't need to be. I think it's just so horrendous, it's like not everyone will face with any discrimination. I think that yeah. It, my experience wasn't great, um, so if I'm talking about my own experience. Yeah. Um, and you, I feel like you can kind of gauge your employer's reaction when you're like pregnant anyway, because yeah. you'll know like what's in your contract in terms of the policies and different things that different companies offer, 
So you can kind of gauge like how you're being treated throughout your pregnancy, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah, um, to a degree. Yeah. No, to a degree. I think, see, I don't think you should even feel worried about telling your employer, but I know that I was. Yeah. I was nervous because I thought they're going to think, and like I did the whole like overcompensating, so I almost was like downplaying, thinking, I'm pregnant, but I'm still going to be here for nine months, like don't discount me. And, and some of that was coming from myself. I think some of yeah. it I just felt because I was really committed to my job at the time, I was very ambitious, and I almost was trying to overcompensate for the fact I was going to be off. And some of it does come from your employer, so some of it's things like as you get closer to going off than um, you know, not inviting you to meetings or not inviting you to things because they just think we're not going to be here, which you know, that's not fair and it's not right and you're not leaving the company, you're taking a short break and then you, know, you might decide to come back or you might not, yeah. but the, until they tell, you tell them otherwise, you're coming back to that role. So you shouldn't be kind of, you shouldn't be made to feel like that. And I think that for some women, they do. And that's not fair either. That's not right either. But you're right. There should be, legally, you've got rights. So know what those rights are would be my advice. And yeah. know that you've got a community of support. Know that you can come on um, the Guilty Mother's Facebook group. is like, if you've got any questions as well, come on. There's like a community of other women on there that are all working mums and that have been yeah. there and... Um, so that'd be that'd be the other thing, and yeah, and I'd say like the guilt thing is quite big as well for mums, and um, particularly, you know, you, you feel like you can't win if you choose to stay at home and be at home with your mum. You feel guilty because you're not yeah. going to work and showing your mum a career and finances. Yeah. And women are guilty when they're not working because they're not working. Yeah, but women are guilty when they're working because they're not with the family. You just, so you just literally sure can't win. Guilt. Avalanche. Yeah, the guilt, the guilt was something that was not prepared for. I've yeah. never flaming stopped. You're literally guilty if you breastfeed. If you don't breastfeed, you feel guilty if you are. Ah. So the mum <laughs> guilt again is something that I think is quite normal and frustrating, but that's probably the mantra of Guilty Mothers Club around ditch the guilt and yeah. kind of know that you're doing the best for you and your kids, and we all are, and that uh, yeah. you know, that, that we might be judged by others, but you're doing what you think is right, and that's the main thing. But I'd love women to have more choices. That'd be the that's the key thing for me. It's not about whether you choose to work or you don't work or um you know, there's no right way. I think yeah, it's I just I like that, women to I have really choice. I feel that message from what you do because like even your courses they're not necessarily about women going and having a baby and then having to be freelance or part time. Yeah, because, no. Because they can't juggle full time with the kids and you're very much about discovering like what's right for you or your yeah. circumstances. I'd love women to have more choice. So many women just don't have the choices because financially you mm-hmm. don't need two parents to work. So you've yeah. got you don't have that choice to stay at home if you wanted to. And I'd love that to change. I think we need to value being at home and caring for children more. Like we my husband's off at the moment with our yeah. children. But you can you can't afford him to do it much longer. He's gonna have to go back to work. And we're really lucky, like, we're one of the lucky ones, because I don't think financially we're kind of, we've been all right. So for lots of women, these aren't choices that are made easily. Yeah. Um, and I'd love it to be more that, and flexible working, women take, having to take roles because they can only get a certain job part-time, so then yeah. they're working in underpaid or jobs they're overqualified for. Like, how frustrating is that? We've no. got these amazing, talented women that are just unable to fulfil their potential because we have a labour market that just isn't set up for being a parent. Like, and it's not even just about being a parent, is it? Like, that's the thing. Like, everyone would want more flexible working, I think, if it was an option. Like, why wouldn't yeah. you want to be able to have a bit more freedom? And the whole 9 to 5 thing, like, that's, that's ancient. Mm-hmm. I don't know why we still have that. So I, I think the flexibility thing is huge. I think if more businesses would embrace that... They would keep their talents, whether they're parents or not. I think they would keep their their talents, and the next generation aren't gonna aren't gonna want nine to five Monday to Friday. It's just not gonna yeah. work. So I think the businesses that are gonna be most successful are gonna get that, start to change, realize that they are losing female talent, and do something about it to keep that talent in the business. Because that yeah, that'd be what I would do. If I'm a massive business. Yeah, definitely. And I think any like working mum will tell you when a mum is at her desk and she has, like, say you're self-employed, you juggle two businesses now, when you're at your desk working, you're need, you need to get that work done yeah, in a yeah, certain yeah. amount of time, otherwise it's not going to get done because you have to do this and then the kids are at home from nursery or whatever. 
So work, like working mums are so productive. Oh, workers. amazing. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> because they amazing. know that they have to utilise like every minute of their time. Yeah. And you've got to leave at a certain time because you've yeah. got the nursery world or the kids exactly. to pick up. So there's no like... Yeah. And e- like equally, if you had your, your role became part time, I personally believe that people could be working three days a week and still be doing the same job. Yeah. Because... A lot of people go to work nine to five, Monday to Friday, and there's so much time wasted because not a lot of people can do that amount of like work focused at a desk and yeah, be completely and productive. Yeah, exactly. Whereas short, I know for me, and I imagine for a lot of people, short bursts yeah. and then breaks work much better. And, and how much more motivated are you? Exactly. If you had four days in your week that was for your family or yeah you know, or when you wanted work, to start like, a business or yeah 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 I, I, yeah I, ge- I genuinely think that that is going to I kind of hope it's a shift that's starting to happen I think it is starting to feel like that do yeah you? I think so um I don't like my friends are only just starting to have babies so I'm sort of not in that conversation yet but what, do they want more flexibility yeah do that's a like do they want to do different stuff or is it all about yeah, one job yeah definitely I mean a lot of my friends are self-employed because that's just like most of my friends I've met through work but yeah I think so hmm. I think I think for people now not everyone wants to run a business or be self-employed but that doesn't mean that people don't want to enjoy the benefits of that flexibility yeah. So big corporations almost need to adapt to that. Yeah. And adapt to that sort of modern way of working. Yeah. Because not everyone wants to start a business. No. But it is like on um, yeah. But it is really good. Yeah, it is really good. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good. So let's do you want to chat about that? About like, the flexibility. Starting a business. Work. Like any women listen to this who might be on maternity leave and might be thinking I really don't want to go back to work yeah like nine to five maybe they want to start a business let's chat about that and then we can talk about like bullet journal and okay good stuff yeah um, <laughs> so I guess that's what we did with Game Changers Game Changers was designed basically because I felt like I didn't know where to go for that support to make that change myself and I did it over the course of maybe two years maybe three years actually between having, kind of having the idea and actually launching and I probably could have definitely done it, well, I definitely could have done it faster and more efficient and it could have been cheaper if I'd had a bit of structure and somebody to help me get out of my own head because I think yeah. I was holding myself back a lot with just fit and sometimes I knew what the right thing to do is. So it's like, oh no, but I'm going to go for the easy option and just try it this way, even though I knew I should probably put myself out there. So, uh, so that's where Game Changers came from, to help women kind of make the, those decisions and um, also think about um, what your values are, we talk about what your strengths are, so getting in touch with all of that, making sure that if you're thinking about doing your own business that um, it's going to be the right thing for you, you're doing it for the right reasons, it's going to be something yeah. you love, because it's really flaming hard as well, isn't it? It's amazing, but it's like the hardest job ever as yeah. well. So I think you have to love it, don't you, if you're going to make it successful. So we do a load of stuff on that, and then we talk about um, all the psychology side, about managing the fear and and self-doubt and having like mantras and affirmations and everything that you can do to get in a kind of mindset and then um we talk about testing ideas out and experimenting with options and then planning to make a change so it really works and it's, it's, it's what I wish I'd had but in terms of me actually starting a business um well there's probably a few things I think you can definitely do it without having to make the leap straight away that's yeah. what I'd say do you either say I mean, that I I'm really lucky and my I still live at home with my mum and dad and they were just sort of like just do things like don't worry <laughs> well, you can. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I did have a part time retail job because I wasn't earning any money from my business yeah. for at least at least a year probably more like two years in terms of actual like I can pay salary. myself a salary yeah. um, and even now like there's still a long way to go basically but yeah, I did work part time retail for like two, maybe three days a week. So, I definitely agree that 
you can, you kind can of do both. Yourself into it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it needs. To, I think sometimes if if it becomes like I have to make a decision to do this or this, it feels massive, doesn't it? And it yeah, feels like especially a, when money's concerned. Oh, just huge. Yeah. And you've got all those kind of yeah financial issues, and so I think in my experience, being able to try it out as a bit of like a side mm. kind of job yeah. and or a project Almost and just like put a hobby that. in life. Yeah. Is yeah. a really good way of testing out the market. And yeah. and I think you can almost if you love you can almost you can test two things, can't you? You can test out whether there's a market for your business idea and you can find out if you love doing it. And I think both things are quite important. Yeah, definitely. So I'd say if you're thinking of if you're on return to leave or if you're whatever you're doing and you're thinking I might want to start my own business. I've got a bit of an idea. Um, yeah, do it as like a hobby or a project. And um, just ask yourself when you're doing it, if it feels like a bit laborious and it's a bit like, oh, I don't want to do this or I hate this side of it, well, is that going to be the job for you then? And it might it might be that there's just elements of it that eventually you would give out to other people. So it's not yeah. like ultimately that. But I think fundamentally, if the type of work you're doing doesn't excite you and motivate you, inspire you, then... Maybe you need to tweak your idea a little bit. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, also financially, you can check out really easily whether it's whether it's going to work or not. And on that, I would say, um, my biggest kind of advice on that, and this is, again, we're learning from experience, is that get out there and actually speak to people about it. I think that's a big difference between do some research online, maybe do a survey online, so I did. It was a massive survey, and I had, like, over 100 people reply saying... It was all about like what courses would you buy and what are, are. But there's so much there's so much difference between what people will tell you and what people will actually pay for. And yeah. also you never get you never get that real conversation. So if I said to you, Would you like a course on this? You might say, Yeah or no on a survey and be like, Great, okay. And surveys have their use, don't get me wrong. I think surveys can be really useful. But if we were having a conversation and I said would you buy a course on that? You might say, I might do, but what I really need is blah, blah, blah. And that's where the gold is, isn't it? When I yeah. start listening to you and think, yeah. oh, actually, what you really need is this, not the course I've already got in my head. Yeah. Definitely. So it's almost designing your idea or your business, I suppose, around the actual customer problem as opposed to the solution that you think you've got in your head and the idea you think you have and then trying to do it back into what you think the customer would buy. It's yeah. like doing it the way around. Yeah. And for me, that comes from getting out there and speaking to people. That was yeah, like one of the, definitely. and that was the real change for me in my business where I did a like maybe six months of research surveys, asking friends and family. That's another one, isn't it? Because they'll always tell you the nice things. So yeah, yeah probably. Well, either or, they either, they're either like, don't take the risk. It's too risky. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't really tend to chat about work with friends or family. I'll I'll let them know what I'm up to, and they're really supportive and lovely. But yeah. like the ins and outs of like. What do you think I should? How do you think I should market this? Or just, yeah. I just find everyone's got an opinion. Exactly. As well. Yeah. And it can take you all over the place, can't yeah. it? And sometimes you have to just like go and listen yeah. to what feels best. What feels best, yeah. yeah. But actually, do a focus group. Just yeah. It feels way more scary, and I get that. But the big change for me was when I started running the workshops in person and had a group of women in front of me and was listening. And that's where Game Changers came from. It all started with the Return to Work workshops. But as I was doing them, at the end, I kept having people say, but I don't want to go back to the same job. Like, what if I want to do something new? Or I'd quite yeah. like to start a business, but I'm a bit kind of, I don't even have any ideas yet. And Game Changers came from that. But I would have never got that from a survey. I'd have never yeah. got that unless I'd started actually with the customers. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. No, and I think that playtime where, like, money isn't the issue because you've got something else yeah. supporting you yeah it's nice to really get in there and gauge those gauge that feedback and see what people want yeah yeah rather than making it this huge launch that you're building up to and then it's just like crickets because no no one wanted that yeah yeah you wanted yeah. it but yeah. nobody else wants it and it's less pressure in some ways yeah because you just see it as playing yeah. It's just a project, it's just a hobby, like literally yeah. treat it in your head like it's a hobby or a project. Especially if, especially if you are struggling at work or you know you might not enjoy your 9 to 5, having a creative outlet elsewhere, yeah, definitely. even though sometimes like when you get home from a long day all you want to do is sit on the couch and not do anything, yeah. actually having something like that to look forward to yeah. can be really like energising as well. 
Somebody said that to me the other day when they were talking about starting their business, somebody that had done Game Changers, and they'd said that they had the motivation on the evening to do it, even though they were absolutely knackered after they put the kids to bed, because it was work that they absolutely loved. Yeah. And I was thinking, that's your answer in some ways as well, isn't it? Like, if you if you love it that much, you are definitely onto something, because yeah. that's going to be or it. if you're at your desk and you can't wait to, like... Yeah. All yeah, you're yeah. thinking about is what you're going to write yeah. about tonight when you get yeah. home. Yeah. <laughs> And that would be another thing. So the other thing I'd say if you were thinking about doing this kind of move or you're thinking of starting a business, it would be to make sure that at the moment you're not giving more of your time than you should to your current paid employment. So um, I'm not suggesting that you like shirk off and <laughs> sky. <laughs> sky. That's not what I'm suggesting. Poor but Nikki. if you currently work through your lunch hours... Yeah. Like, take that back. That, You've got, like, an hour there. That off when people do that. Yeah, <laughs> I used to do all the time. Yeah. I mean, I don't mind doing it now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't much I do. But I can take, like, three hours off during the day if I wanted to, and I often will if I've yeah. like, got a lunch or something. Yeah. But, yeah, you're not being paid for that hour, and you're not going to be getting really focused, productive work done during that hour anyway if you work no. eight hours straight. So. no. So, yeah, you'd be yeah. more productive. So actually, because that's the other thing, I think, particularly as um, a working mum, you feel like, and if you've got shorter hours, you're like, I've only got three days, I've only got four days, I've got to ramp everything in it. You know, I've got to work long hours to be able to get through it. And I get that because I was exactly the same. I was missing bedtime three or four nights a week, even though my hours probably should have been to about half five, staying till like half seven, eight, just to try and get my job done. Yeah. And so I completely understand that. But when I realised that was happening and I was doing this kind of side project, I was thinking, but I'm giving them all these hours. And in my head, up for me, I was thinking of making a change anyway. So I was like, why am I giving all these? I was literally giving yeah. my time for free. And yeah. when I started realising that that's what I was doing, they were paying for my time. I was a commodity and they had paid me a certain amount of money for my time. What I was choosing to do was give them a little extra for free. I was like, no, I have to take that back. And so yeah. I stopped doing that to be able to give me some more energy and time to focus. And another another um, previous um, game changer had said to me that she realised that she was when she was commuting um, for work, again, she was doing work on the train, and she decided that she was going to take that time back to work on her own game change. Yeah. And she, she gained about 10 hours a week. Exactly. That's a lot of time yeah. to be able to then focus on yeah. your own Even thing. if you like... Go on a walk on your lunch break if it's nice, and sit with a notebook. Yeah. And just scribble down some notes or ideas. Like yeah. That is so that's gonna energize you so much. Yeah. It's also that valuable time where you could have just been sat at your desk, plowing on, and you wouldn't yeah. have been making being productive anyway because your mind would have turned off about three hours ago. Yeah. So now we've chatted about people starting businesses. Yeah. Let's talk about organisation, time management, bullet journals. We've kind of already touched on some time management stuff, like Yeah. making the most of your time. Yeah. But, yeah. When did you start bullet journaling? Mm. And, like, what are the other tools along with bullet journaling that you love in your business? Um, I think I started bullet journaling about three years ago, and... Yeah, it took me a while to get into it. I think it does, doesn't it? I think when you first start, it's kind of a bit alien and it felt a bit difficult it felt a bit complicated and I was yeah. put off a bit by all the beautiful spreads on Pinterest and I was thinking yeah. I'm not that creative that's the number one like issue that I get in comments like people saying I just can't start one because it's not going to look perfect and then yeah. I'm really annoyed yeah. that it's not perfect so yeah I did that but I think what helped it is that when I first started it I, I was like I'm going to start in this rubbish book and then I'm going to move it into my beautiful book I did that. and that almost helps you get past the yeah. well, it doesn't matter because it's just my rubbish book and then actually my beautiful book just became the same because I'm not that pretty <laughs> and I'm not that good at it in terms of creativity but that's not what it is no it's not it's all it, it's your life, like, managed within a notebook, isn't it? Yeah. I do still swoon over the people that can make it beautiful. Yeah. I think, for me, personally, I feel like it's an extra hobby for some people. Yeah. And they genuinely love doodling yeah. and drawing. It's a really nice outlet, isn't it, for yeah. being creative. Yeah. And, yeah. I don't get that from my bullet journal. My bullet journal, like, saves me time and makes more time in my day. Yeah. Because... I'm scheduled, I'm, I'm on top of everything, I'm more productive. 
but yeah, each to their own. Like if you want to like doodle and stuff, that's great, but not for me. I do a bit yeah. of both. And now I do a bit of both. What I do yeah. like is that it makes me... So I plan my week on a Friday, yeah. religiously on a Friday afternoon. I will stop and have an hour and plan the week afterwards. And I think the fact that I make myself do it and have enough time for it means that I sometimes don't have time to just colour in the odd like, bit and yeah. make it. So it's not really beautiful, but I think kind of having time it's to fun. do that feels nice. And it's yeah. Fun. yeah. Yeah, I do like that. So um, I use my bullet journal. I wouldn't be without my bullet journal. I, 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 t- I went somewhere last week and I left it at home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, and I literally kind of did the whole thing. I was like, well, I can't do any work. I don't know what I'm doing today. I, I was a bit lost about it. I know. It's quite bad, really, that in this, like, in this day, it, it is just going back to the traditional like, pen and paper, and that's the appeal of it for me. Yeah, me too. Because I do feel more on top of things if I've wrote it down, and I do feel more... I do feel more organised when it, everything's on pen and paper, but it's not practical. Technology. It's not always practical. Like in this day and age, if you've forgotten, if you've forgotten it, you've got your phone, which is surgically attached to you at all times. You never yeah, leave the house yeah, yeah. the phone. So yeah, that's yeah. why I do my calendar on the phone. phone. I don't even do that. My calendar. Yeah. Just because at least then there's something. That yeah, I got with me. the thing I do use, so I don't just use my bullet journal, I use yeah. Trello, so I swear by Trello. Yeah, I've just started using mm. that again. Yeah, Maybe. and so the reason I use Trello alongside it is that I think if you've got longer projects, I'm not sure your bullet journal works quite so well. Yeah. Because you've got your future log that you can log things, but actually I have projects that are spanning like 8, 12 weeks, and I need to have that like planned out and yeah. I'm not sure that works in my bullet journal so yeah. and the other thing with Trello is that I work with Anna so Anna and I yeah. share the mothership and so um, she has her own planning tools but we share Trello so we have a Trello board that's called mothership um, and on there we both go in and um, we've when we have our weekly planning meeting together we will have always have an agenda so there's even a card on Trello, which is for the agenda. And so yeah. if throughout the week you think, oh, I need to speak to her about that, or um, something comes up that I want to tell her, I just write it on the agenda. And again, that stops us distracting each other throughout the week and being constantly chatting, because that's yeah. not that productive. Unless we just want to chat about, like, I don't know, something that's gone on. But, you know, we yeah. try and be a bit more structured. Because at first we were just constantly bombarding each other yeah. and not getting any work done. So we have, like, we have an agenda card on Trello, um, we also have an agenda when we catch up, so we always have certain things that we talk about. And then we, on a monthly basis, plan out the month ahead in terms of membership content. And yeah. we always know what we've got coming up for content, but in terms of uploading onto the website and all the other jobs that we need to do. And we just create cards for everything on Trello. So if anyone who hasn't seen Trello, it's basically like a... It's like kind of... I imagine it like a big piece of white paper with post-it notes, only it's electronic. Yeah. And you just move them all. You just move everything around. Yeah. yeah. And you can create your board however you like. So some people have got a board with to do and complete it. And others have dates on the top. You can kind of... Yeah. The great thing about Trello is that you can make it look however you want it to look, can't you? Work yeah. For you, which is what we love about it. So we allocate each other jobs out. We've got all the due dates. And I also like you can go in and mark it as done. And then Anna can see that it's done. And I can drag it across. And yeah. So yeah, that works okay. really well. I do love Trello. And Trello basically helps me, helps then on a weekly basis, I have a planning routine. So on a Friday afternoon, I plan my week ahead. And um, obviously some things are already in the diary before then, so I know that. And it's more just a case of looking at my calendar and writing on where I am and what I'm doing. Yeah. And then I have certain schedules of time, and we were just talking about this actually, to try and block time within the week so that... Um, I guess it gives my week a bit of like a rhythm and a routine so I know what I'm doing and not everyone would be able to do that but that works for me that I know that I'll do certain things yeah. and I also have a kind of monthly rhythm routine as well so I send out a newsletter monthly, I do my finances monthly so when I do like my monthly planning I always know that I will do that on a certain day and I'll plot yeah. it in. That's exactly what I do in my Google calendar Yeah. and then when I'm planning my bullet journal for the week I'm like oh I said I'd do my like bookkeeping on Wednesday so I'll so I won't I'm like no <laughs> I don't want to do it yeah. Yeah. that exact yeah. thing yeah so yeah. that's that but I use Trello then on a, on a weekly basis on a Friday I'll pull up my Trello boards and, and everything will be like oh that's due next week that's due next week so there'll be things that I'll also plot in around that I take from Trello if that makes yeah. sense yeah and I love Trello as well for future projects that you might not be 
they're just sort of ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I have a list of, say, like, brands that I want to work with yeah. in the blog on my Instagram. And I might not, like, they don't need to go on a bullet journal, but I know they're there. Yeah, I know. you just don't want to lose them, but you don't want them in your head. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So even, like, if you were planning content seasonally mm-hmm. and you thought of some great ideas for summer and it's up, it's only January. Yeah. So I feel like Charles really good for that as well. The only thing I'm missing, I don't have kind of quite... I do this currently on an Excel spreadsheet. Maybe there's another way of doing this. Maybe you're listening to one. <laughs> <laughs> Is that I do like at the start of the year, I do my annual planning. Yeah. I have an Excel spreadsheet which has got all the months across the top and I call it like my master plan. Yeah. I do like to go through and put in any kind of key dates from a business. So yeah. it seems like International Women's Day or yeah. Equal Pay Day and I like to go through and plot all those in. Um, I know when all my courses are starting throughout the year so I can yeah. see that. And it's that like full 12 month overview. overview, which I currently do in Excel and I kind of half questioned whether actually I should buy one of those big 12 month calendars it's that really I, cool. yeah, yeah and I thought I could put them on my wall because yeah. I do I'm quite visual and I quite yeah, like to see it yeah, yeah in the loft yeah yeah nice I do have a wall one on the wall yeah and that would help me to see that the overview because that's the yeah. only thing I do tend to plan plan monthly and quarterly but to be able to see it of course yeah hmm. less of a tip more of a <laughs> where can I get yeah. one <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's true do you find that now you're self-employed, you're like way more organised, or you spend more time like scheduling in things? And because I, th- I think people assume that when you become self-employed, you can just like doss about all day. There's like the stereotype of someone who works from home. They're like, "Oh, do you want to go for lunch?" And you're like, "Well, yeah, at this time, but then I need to get home to do this." Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I found that since becoming self-employed, I, I obviously I work more, but I also have to spend a lot more time organising myself because no one's yeah. You. you also don't have anyone else's deadlines or anyone else's. Yeah. I mean, you do because you have your customers' deadlines, yeah. but not. You have to like, in make the same up way. your own deadlines. Yeah, sometimes you do have to make up your own deadlines. Mm. Because you're definitely more organised. Yeah, because people think that. It's so flexible and you can just do it whenever, but that isn't actually the case because there's usually many different hats that you have to wear. And I, I, I love organising, it's like an actual hobby, like, I genuinely enjoy doing it. So being self-employed for me is great because you do have to spend yeah. a lot of time organising yourself. You get loads of autonomy, don't you? That is, <laughs> like, autonomy's up there for yeah. me is kind of one of my massive values that, that is kind of... I suppose part of my work for myself because yeah. I love being able to have that. But yeah, what comes the, the, I suppose the downside of autonomy is that you do have to do quite a lot of that for yourself. Yeah. And be quite strict with yourself over things like five well. so, yeah. yeah. So there are some days when you wake up and you're like, oh, I just don't want to watch Netflix today. Yeah. And you're like, no, come on. And I think you always get that. I remember when I first started getting that in my business, I was like, oh, maybe it's not the right job for me. And then I thought, no, I think everyone gets this. Even yeah. if you're doing a job you love, some days you kind of can't be bothered. Yeah. And that's just life, isn't it? Yeah, and I feel like businesses go through seasons as well. Yeah. Because if you've had like a dip or you've not been getting as many client inquiries yeah. or whatever, it can be a bit discouraging. Yeah. But then in the next month, you'll get loads and you'll be like wanting to hop out of bed at 7am yeah. yeah. and yeah, be like straight true. into work. Yeah. So it's just that. Like a flow. Yeah, it definitely yeah. is a flow. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is a flow. And sometimes I think that when you're like, it's useful to know what re-motivates you and what re-inspires you on those days. Yeah. So for me, I really like to be around people, and sometimes I find it quite lonely. The fact that I work with Anna, but we tend to work in our own. Actually, it's at her house. I work here, yeah. and and um, we collaborate a lot of stuff. But I still have days where I think I'm just missing kind of conversation. And I think that's particularly true when you have those dips where you've not made as much money that month as you needed to or yeah. you know something's gone wrong or and you really feel it and you miss that's when I really miss a team yeah because in my old job I'd have had a big team around me and I'd have been able to really proactively like yeah 
and bounce off them and have somebody else to say like, oh, that's a nightmare. So some of that now comes from the mothership for me. So we have a channel called Shit That Went Wrong. And oh, that's great. I know. And everyone just shares when things it. go wrong. And that, but that's what I needed. Like yeah. it was created because it was what I was missing, I think. Yeah. That I needed somebody to just be able to say, has anyone else had this? Anyone, especially if they're starting a business, but definitely also if they're running a business, mm. goes through that stuff. Yeah. But it's really hard to talk about, like, I failed at this, or this client rejected me, or this client ghosted me. Yeah. Has that ever happened to no. you? No. Oh my God, it's the worst. What does that mean? I don't like, know what it means. Go, it's like a dating term that basically means just cutting someone off. Oh. Like, so never texting them back, like, just cut, like, going from, like, dating someone or sleeping together or whatever, and then just never speaking to them again. So in the dating world, ghosting so not being that means ghosting. No, I'm not, but I've just I've picked it up from somewhere. But yeah. Oh, that's a bit yeah. But quite like have you is that no. happened to you? Or even like a prospective client. Oh and yeah. And seem like dead in dead yeah. enthusiastically yeah, yeah. just no. And you're like, no, come back. But it's yeah. hard to talk about those things. You can't talk about them always online to your community because it's unprofessional it's trying so to find that line isn't have, it it's good to have somewhere where you can be yeah. vulnerable and say like it's the vulnerable thing yeah i've done this and i think it was a bit shit or yeah yeah oh it's horrible when you get that feeling as well isn't it <laughs> oh God. yeah it is horrible so, yeah. i feel like we've yeah. covered a good it's not all sunshine and rainbows but there is some really good bits it's about it room. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so I want to chat about self care. Yeah. And not just self care, but so this podcast is called Put Yourself First mm-hmm. because I'm really passionate about women putting themselves first and making time for themselves. Not only to look after themselves, but to make time for their goals. Yeah. And their like personal hopes and dreams and things that they think oh, I'd love to do that, but. A lot of women would just put that on the back burner and not think about it again because work, family, whatever. Yeah. And you're obviously championing these women to go after what they want and find something they love to do. So I just want to chat about that, really. Because I think a lot of women feel the guilt and think that it's selfish yeah, to make time for themselves. Well, that's a really hard back, isn't so it? How do you like tackle that with your clients and the people that like the women in your community what do you um, like how do you encourage them to think to realize that it's not selfish well in the mothership we encourage it by making it part of what we talk about so we don't just talk about work we always have a project that's about play every month as well so that's called almost an encouragement but i think the hard thing, I think, is that it has to almost come from you and you have to prioritise it. So yeah. no matter how what you get told or, you know, that people say it's not selfish to do that or you're given all these different ideas about self-care, but I think until you prioritise it yourself and make it part of your routines and really believe that you're worth that time, I think it's quite hard to make the yeah. shift. Um, and I also get, I think sometimes the self-care thing has become a bit synonymous with, like, take a bubble bath once a month. And I actually think it's more than that. I think yeah. it's about speaking nicely to yourself and yeah. not, you know, speaking to yourself like you would speak to your friends. You would never say some of the stuff that you say to yourself. And I think that is about self-care too. Definitely. I think it's about hearing that that inner critic who kind of tells you that, you know, whatever it is, and we all have them. And, um, you know, for me, it's things like you're choosing to work. So you've obviously chosen not to be with your kids. And, you know, that just comes into your head and it's being able to recognize that and say like that's not true I am yeah. choosing to work but not at the expense of my kids yeah by choosing to work um I think I'm a better parent I'm yeah. more um available when I am there because um I'm, I've got other things in my life that make me feel inspired I think that and hopefully I'm you know I'm setting an example that well, in our house, particularly, like, Gazzy's at home, so we're showing yeah. that men look after kids and Which women work. I feel like you need to come back for a part two just to talk about, like, dads. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I <laughs> and, think it's like, really dad's important. Working, dad's, yeah. dad's being at home with the kids and just... That's a massive thing to yeah. me. I think or that, just being, like, more involved. 
and mothers want to be. Yeah, exactly. And w- women asking dads to be more involved in a way that works for them and not feeling like they can't ask. Oh, there's a huge, there's a there's huge like shift. expectation that. There's, yeah. no, there's loads of issues behind it because things like the fact that shared parental this is probably a whole other topic yeah. but the fact that shared parental leave yeah. yeah that's a great book by the yeah, way yeah, struggle with that yeah, <laughs> it is a good book the fact that shared parental leave isn't paid in the same way that maternity leave is is that from the very outset the way that our country is set up and our society is yeah. set up is that women are the primary carers of children financially socially culturally all sits around that very thing therefore you know it would take quite a big shift to be able to say I'm going to be a lot worse off financially but I really want to be at home with the kids like that's quite big in itself and then you've yeah. got the fact that like you know how many flexible jobs are there that men can apply for as well like it's not like yeah. I know my husband's going back and thinking that he'd like to work flexibly there's not that many jobs for men either so it's yeah. not you know flexibility is not just about women it's and about there's men same, there's a lot of shame there for men culturally to be in those high, huge. high roles yeah be like the top performer or the top salesman or whatever. Yeah, so there's that whole other thing going on yeah. that I think... But but coming back to your question about self-care, that's, <laughs> yeah, sorry, well, that's totally a big fun. thing, isn't it? Because yeah. for women, and particularly working mums, what I see and what I felt was that not only are you working and, um, you know, wanting to progress your career or whatever that looks like, you've also got... So there's a massive shift still that needs to happen in the home in terms of gender yeah. roles. So often when we do the majority... We still know that percentage-wise, when we do the majority of the household chores, they yeah. do the majority of the childcare responsibilities, organising parties, Christmas, all of that unpaid work. So we have women that are more successful now and, um, you know, we're starting to make that shift in the workplace, but home isn't, isn't catching up. Yeah. So what I see is, like women feeling massively knackered and then guilty about being knackered and just this burnout happens. So self-care becomes even more of a big thing then. But what I don't think it should become is, here's another thing for my list, self-care. Like, seriously, it's like, oh Um, man, I've got so much to do and now I've got to add in like a bath. We're going to fit that in. And it shouldn't be another thing to feel guilty about. Exactly. Because women feel guilty that they've not, oh, I've not been to the gym once this week. Yeah, or... And now you're going to fit in like a massage. That's not, that's not the idea. Like, it's supposed to be fun and good. Yeah. And it can be really small things. So, yeah. for me, self-care is about meditating. Like, I have to meditate, and I do so pretty religiously, and I feel quite yeah. different from being able to do that. And that, for me, is self-care, because it's recognising that slowing down for 10 minutes every day is worth my time, and that I am worth that 10 minutes, if that makes sense. Yeah, so I think... We, we're quite good at self-care as in as a family, so Gazi and I'll have a conversation where we'll say at a weekend, um, we'll allocate each other free time, which sounds a bit geeky, but we'll say like, you're two hours there and I'm two hours there. Yeah. But Gazi's really good at saying like, he would not give up his free time for anyone, <laughs> if it's a man thing, but he's kind of, they're my two hours. Yeah. So we'll watch the football and then what sometimes happens is that I'll find myself thinking on those two hours oh so the kids need something so I'll do that I'll look on the internet and find that for the kids or um, oh, I'll just catch up on those that I don't know what needs to do it or like yeah. I've got this massive jobs list and I'm thinking oh what I'll do in the two hours I'll feel better if I can yeah. just catch up <laughs> yeah and then you've got to remind yourself that no actually the whole point of the two hours is to have some dedicated time on you yeah so what I've learned has really helped is to have some sort of hobby or project, like we were saying, which doesn't necessarily have to be about work, that you know that you would spend that time on so that you almost have to do that, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I've... Um, so I mean, like sign up to something. Yeah. Like commit to something. Yeah. Yeah. Or start something, like think I'm going to do an online course on calligraphy. Yeah. And then think, oh... Bought it and pay for yeah, it. Yeah. So. I've got a few hours. That's yeah. what I'm going to do, as opposed to than just, oh, I just love reading, so I just go upstairs and, like, before now I have taken my book to a coffee shop and just sat in the coffee shop and read my book for a few hours. Yeah. And that's felt like a massive luxury, like, oh, so indulgent, but so lovely. Yeah. So that would be one thing I would say, is that allocate the time and then use it and prioritise it and make sure that it doesn't get given over to other things. And then my other thing would be to recognise, so sometimes I think it can be useful to and notice where your time is going so you might think oh, I've not had any time for myself this week but actually you spent like half an hour on Facebook after yeah. bedtime just on your phone and so 
I certainly lose time to that. So I think it's yeah. being a bit more conscious of, uh, you know, when the kids are in bed um, and I come down and I've just done all the clearing up, sometimes it feels like if you enjoy it, like if Facebook is your release and you enjoy spending half an hour and that is kind of, that is your downtime, but recognise that and say, yeah. this is my self-care and choosing to spend it on half an hour on Facebook. Or if that is actually making you feel a bit more anxious and like, not enjoyable, yeah. then spend that half an hour reading a book or spend that half an hour, you know, I don't know, whatever you like doing, like give yourself a facial or the, these pockets of time. I think you can, once you recognise where it's going, I think it's quite handy to then reallocate something to it. Yeah. Um, in a really conscious way. Like, yeah. You go and grab your phone, like, almost impulsively and then think, oh, yeah. actually, no, I'm going to, I've got half an hour before I need to go to bed. I'm going to like, do. have a bath or yeah. or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> said, bubble baths are like a cliche, but I love them. But that's, <laughs> yeah. Bath. It's only a cliche when yeah. it becomes like, do some self-care. I think it's because a bath is where I will do nothing or yeah. I'll watch trashy, like, Netflix shows or read a mag I don't I won't bring a book in the bath because I'm scared to drop it in. <laughs> no, it's so it's just a a really bath. nice like brand new like self help book and then it's still probably work related anyway. Yeah. <laughs> this is yeah. the other thing. This is definitely the thing in that yeah. I am a massive self help yeah like addict. So I'll listen to TED Talks and yeah. then I have to think, oh but that's not that's kind of work. Yeah. And it's still a bit worky. My partner's really good with that and you know he said your husband's like, no, I'm not giving time away to anyone. I'm yeah. watch football. Adam's really good in that. He knows that I will take any opportunity to be productive in some way. Yeah, yeah. So he's like, just stop it now. <laughs> he's There's like, no let's just watch TV. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I can just get my coffee done. And I'm like, I can just reply to tweets while we watch TV. And he's like, no. no. We put our phones away. We like throw them at the end of the couch or at the end of the bed. Yeah, just, like, sit there and I'm like, okay, I'm going to relax. That's <laughs> bad, isn't it? Yeah. I don't think it's playing nice <laughs> Yeah, no. So I'd, I'd make it, and actually remember, I think I always keep in my head as well, and this helps me, is that particularly in work, when I'm just like, go, go, go all day sometimes, that actually, I, like you said, you lose productivity anyway. Yeah. So by stopping for a proper lunch break or going for a quick walk or... It counts as self care, I think, because you're yeah. recognizing that your body needs something back and can't just keep going all day. Um, yeah. But if you're a bit like a productive freak, like we are, then you can almost tell yourself that you're doing it so that you are more productive. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, it's great. So, the quick round questions at the end. We've already well, we've already covered the first one, which is what are your self care rituals? So okay. Meditation. Allocating time to it, yeah, and being really strict at honouring that time for yourself, yeah. um, discovering pockets of time that you might be wasting, yeah, you could be doing reading, really always nice reading those, well. yeah, love to read. Um, so reading, anything else that you love to do? Um, I'm doing knitting again. Oh knitted on that. Yeah. I'm not a very good knitter. But do you I'm know what so rubbish with crafts and arts things. I'm just. Yeah, but you know, my, you know, I'm not very good at knitting, but... Do you find it relaxing? I find it relaxing. Yeah. So, who cares? I'm I, feel like, I still feel like that about those colouring books, you know, they're like do a massive Do you know? Yeah. I love, they love a colouring box. No, I do too. No artistic skill Just colour. Just colour. Just literally a pencil. Yeah. Really. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like that. Yeah, do yeah. that. Yeah. I love it. Cool. So you're giving loads of ideas there for people. Um, next question is, what's challenging you to leave your comfort zone and grow recently? Um, so I'm doing like a um, business accelerator scheme called yeah. Entrepreneurial Spark and that has definitely made me move out of my comfort zone. I've had to do things like pitch for 60 seconds and um, just it's made me think about business completely differently. And I think yeah. that is that would be my other tip around that. I think if you work for yourself and you work and you're constantly in your business and surrounded by the people that are doing similar stuff, it can be really good to step right back from it sometimes. Yeah, it's like a bubble. It becomes a bubble. And I've been around other entrepreneurs that are doing things that are completely different to me. So you think no synergies, but actually I've learned so much from just yeah. being around people doing totally different stuff. So yeah, in, in that way, that's properly taken me out of my comfort zone and been, yeah, I can't recommend that enough. Yeah, I really need to apply to that because I'm, I did mention it and I did a video on business resources the other day and because you and Danielle King, who's 
going to be on the podcast soon, um, of both like members of it, members. You apply to join it, yeah, it's yeah. Like a, But you could do anything, just look at, you know, yeah, just go on, a, go on a one-day conference that's something yeah. that's kind of semi-related, but not... Yeah. You know, it's not like exactly... It's like stepping out of your usual... Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I love yeah. that. What a great way to like force yourself to leave your comfort zone. Yeah. Which I'm all about. Yeah. Next question is what are your 2018 goals and what can we get excited to see from Guilty Mothers Club and the Mothership in 2018? I'm Helen. <laughs> so my the mothership's gonna keep growing, hopefully. The plan is that, that will we'll open again for the next intake on the first of April. Mm-hmm. So we're gonna um, welcome a whole new set of mums into the mothership and that they can grow that community can just keep growing and becoming even more race than it already is. That's my plan for that. Um, I mean, we're going to hopefully have another 100 women go through Game Changers this year, and I'm relaunching, so the course, the workshops that started the whole thing when I was supporting women going back to work after maternity, that I did in the front room, are going online in March, so my plans for, I'm quite excited about that, because that's where it all started, and it's something I'm very passionate about, that women shouldn't have to have to go through that on their own, so um, the return to work workshops are starting again in March. So that's my other goal, is that that will start. And that Guilty Mothers Club will just keep growing as a, a brand by the end of yeah. the year. And they put me personally, I want to write some more. I'd like yeah. to write some fiction. I've just really? said that out loud. Ooh, Children's exciting. fiction. I've got yeah. lots of ideas in my head, and I've written a load down in a notebook. But I'm not going to do it for... It's a personal goal. I'm not doing it as like a work thing, or I don't yeah. want to be published. I just... That's my kind of that's you now you say that you're not that crafty. I think you've all got we've all got ways of being creative that isn't necessarily crafting. Yeah. And that's my creativity. I yeah. love writing. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna write just for my own kids and I'm gonna properly write out the ideas that are in my head. The last question is where can people go to find Guilty Mothers Club and the mothership online? Yes. And you, follow okay. you everywhere. So you can find um, the website guiltymothersclub.co.uk. The Facebook group, which is lovely, is the uh, Guilty Mothers Clubhouse. That's on Facebook. So if you just search Guilty Mothers Club on Facebook, you should be able to find it under groups. Yeah. Um, and that's a nice place to hang out. So yeah, definitely. Uh, that's not that's free. That's not yeah. mothership. So you can just come over there and ask questions. And lots of women share useful articles around anything to do with being a mum, I suppose. And um, yeah, having a career. But you don't have to be a working mum. Generally, it's just a nice place to be yeah. for mums. Um, and uh, if you head to the website, you send the newsletter, and that's where you'd hear about any of the courses. So, and and would also let you know about the mothership intake, and we share a load of stuff on the newsletter too. So, um, and then on, on social media, it's Guilty Mothers Club on Instagram. Don't really do Twitter. <laughs> that's bad. <laughs> I think I am on there. If you find me, you'd be like, I know. It's fine. If you find me, you'd be like, is this her? She's not tweeted for about yeah. six months. <laughs> you on Instagram it's fun. Instagram and Facebook then to be like yeah. yeah see I'm rubbish on Facebook and I'm always like oh, I need to do something on Facebook this week so it's just like where yeah. the thing is isn't it I like Twitter it's just you've got, to, you've got so much time to go you've got to like choose yeah. which one you focus on haven't you yeah so Instagram websites Facebook group yeah 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 cool Thanks so much for talking to me today. Thanks, it's been lovely. It's been really really useful. Yeah, I feel like we've covered a lot and there's loads of like tips and good like nuggets of wisdom for people to take away. Mm, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for watching and listening everyone. If you go to cathorrocks.com forward slash podcast, this podcast will be on there along with all of the links to Helen's stuff along with Helen and and a stop at the mothership so make sure you go and give us some love and obviously we'll both be on social media and things if you want to ask us any questions about this podcast <laughs> yay thanks so much bye <laughs>